Hey everyone, hopefully you're having a good day. My name's Andy, my channel's Finding Value. Uh, today, we're gonna go over uh, the gold to oil ratio, uranium to, to oil ratio, what I, what I look at when determining investments. Uh, I've got on the right-hand side here, I'm gonna go over that first, I think. You know, what, what do I look for? Why did I choose the areas that I'm choosing? Uh, so what I look for is a, is a big bear market in something, and this works for commodities very well. And the reason I like commodities so much is that they can have outsized returns in very short time frames, especially if the valuations get to extreme lows. It's not so much with companies that control their selling price. So what if you have a company that can control its selling price, like any company that is a consumer type company. So think of like Apple or any of these other ones. And what, what they do is they can control whatever they sell, the phone or the computer or whatever it is. And what they rely on is basically the growth and adoption of their products, the S-curve. In commodities, it's a little bit different. They don't control the selling price of what they sell. The market controls it. And that's what's really awesome about it because what happens is you can have very good well-run companies that are in a commodity sector and in a bear market, they're going to get sold way off. And you could have good companies that are high cost producers, medium cost producers, or low cost producers. And what I look for is I look for a commodity price that went into a bubble and then basically sold off after the bubble. So you can buy really good companies for very cheap prices based off of the market conditions of that commodity. And in bear markets, most of the time, the companies are hated. I look for a hated company. It could be a good company, but it's hated for some reason. Whatever it is, it's in the wrong sector, it's a high cost producer, it, but it has good management. It's just in a sector that's not in favor. And another thing I look for is lack of investment. The longer the bear market and the further the valuation stays below the, the cost uh, of the producers, the high cost producers and medium cost producers, the longer it stays below that, the more damage it occurs to the company. So if you're not in the sector, it's staying down, staying down, staying down, then you see it start to come back up. You can say, well, these companies survived what I would consider to be one of the worst bull market or bear markets in a very long time. So the companies that survived are probably pretty good. They probably have pretty good management teams for the most part. I mean, you're still going to look into it. And then uh, the competition basically went away. So you have limited number of investments to go into because of the long bear market. And if a lot of companies died off, uh, you, you probably have a pretty good a pretty good chance of finding a good company uh, and the money flows when they when they go to come in are going to be funneled into even less companies which is good and that lack of investment means that it's probably going to take a long time to bring on new production depending on what the commodity is and an another one i look at is tough to bring to the market is it tough to get this stuff to market it, is it a long lead time is it a short lead time if you're in a really long bear market that's below the cost of the high cost producers or medium cost producers, and it's really hard to bring onto market, people don't want the mine. They don't want uh, a whole bunch of different, whatever it is. It just takes a long time. It's capital intensive. It means that the price can rocket on the upside because the supply is slow to respond. So that's, that's something I look at. Uh, are there government policies that are preventing these things? from going into production, because maybe that's a good one to get into that already has its licenses and, and whatnot. What risks are there? Risks of, of, I should say, external, internal risks, whatever the risks are. Countries' risks, uh, I do look at that. Uh, I look at what is the value to society that that commodity has. This, is it very, very valuable? Is it used by many people? Is it kind of a, a, a niche product? What value does it bring? Uh, what do the inventory levels look like? 
if they're incredibly low and inventory is getting eaten up, and at some point it's going to radically change the pricing mechanism because of how low the inventories are getting, that's something I like to look at. I look at market balances out in the future, and those are projections. Uh, inventory is, I mean, that, that'll that tell you quite a bit. Market projections are just a projection, but if they're really radical out there, that may also draw some attention to it. Uh, I talked about below the cost curves, technical chart patterns. Uh, I also look at check technical chart patterns, and what I look for there is I look for, I look for patterns that uh, basically looks like they're coming down in a downtrend and then they, they stop, the trend stops, it goes sideways in an accumulation phase. And then I like to see they almost you know start to come back up. So our timing's pretty good. And then I look at also money flows or volume. And I'm gonna go over a couple of things I look at. I'm gonna go over oil and uranium here. For, for an example, I, I like energy a lot. And what makes them so good is uranium is the one of the highest energy return on energy invested fuel types for electricity. And I don't know how you can get around that very well. It's also, it's an ESG positive. It's very safe. Uh, there's really nothing to really knock against it outside of a once in a blue moon accident. Uh, but it, there's huge value to society uh, from all those aspects. Uh, it was hated for a very long time. It's very hard to bring to market. Uh, it was at incredibly low valuations. Uh, and the, the charts looked incredibly well. So, I mean, it hit it, it aligned on everything that I, that I look for in an investment. Uh, oil is another one. It's hated. There's a lack of investment in it. Uh, the, it's the number one commodity. The value to society uh, is massive. We use it everywhere. It, it, we are literally drenched in energy uh, and oil specifically uh, for everything. Uh, we, we eat food, which is I would consider to be the most valuable thing to humans is water, food, uh, and, and transportation, uh, shelter and heating, all that stuff. And energy is dripping on all of those things. They, they talk about converting energy into food. And oil is really the thing that's driving it until we get to something else. So I would consider oil to be one of the most vital commodities uh, of anything because whatever energy we have, all products, all food, all everything is nothing more than energy being converted to something that we can use uh, or need. And energy is that thing that, can, that does that conversion. Uh, the cheaper the energy source, the better and cheaper it is for uh, everything in the world. The more expensive energy sources become, uh, the more expensive everything becomes. So I'm going to go over kind of some stuff that I look at. Uh, what I So you're going to lose me here. What I have in the upper left here is, I'll try to keep both of them on here, the gold to oil ratio. And this ratio tells us relative value. Uh, we are still in this uptrend channel. We're trying to break out of it to the downside. I think it's going to happen some point soon. We went from a very undervalued state. Uh, it went all the way to 150, if you want to know. These got all, numbers got all crunched up. And we went above the top channel. We went up and came right back in. And we came all the way down to the lower end of the channel uh, at 25.7, which is incredibly cheap. Still. And we're trying to break out the downside. So I bought a lot up in here uh, because I saw the market conditions were changing in real estate, going into expansion phase. Uh, that to me triggers a shift uh, potentially in a low inflation environment to a higher inflation environment. I'm also seeing that the CRB index itself broke its downtrend. I'm seeing downtrends broken in all different types of commodities. And the valuations are, were all incredibly cheap and have turned more favorable. I can say the same for uranium. Uh, uranium's right there. That's the uranium to, to gold ratio. 
Uh, we were up here at 62 pounds to one ounce. Uh, we are right now at about 42 or so. And we are declining down, sucking up some of that value. But looking at history, this is still incredibly cheap uh, looking at history. So we're just kind of starting this bull market in commodities. And a lot of people have already seen a lot of returns on their companies from the bottom of 2020. And I would say that we just were coming from the most undervalued state ever. And I think we're going to compress these all the way down to the other highs and probably compress this all the way to below 10 for oil. Now, looking at the inflation hedge, when consumer prices accelerate, copper tends to rise three times more than gold. That's that copper to gold ratio and also how that's correlated to rising interest rates. But if you look at the bottom here, this is the gains for every 1% annual rise in US CPI. So energy is the most leveraged to uh, inflation. And you can look at that as good or bad. If we're in a high inflationary environment, energy does great. If we're in and we get it wrong and we have uh, something wrong with inflation or we have a deflation, then yeah, energy gets absolutely crushed. But I think that energy and inflation are going to do very well uh, over the five to 10 year period. Here's crude oil. I just grabbed a chart doing a uh, price chart. You can see that it's breaking to the upside of this pattern. Uh, when you break chart patterns, you're breaking a psychological containment that the herd has put on the price. And I would suspect that this would continue higher over time. I don't know what the path looks like. This could come back down to 60 or even all the way down here and retest and go higher. It's possible. But this is what I something I look for is a broken chart pattern, even though I was buying at the bottom in here because I, I was seeing the pattern start starting to develop. Looking at SM Energy, uh, we obviously have a chart pattern break. And we've broken that long-term pattern to the upside and everything's looking really good. Uh, Forces Metals, you can see the downward trend that I was talking about, the sideways movement, and now we're moving up. This looks fantastic for a long-term hold. Uh, and notice that both of these energy companies, and, and again, these are just, I just took these randomly as a uh, example of each sector. Notice that they're both putting in patterns that are bottoming and heading higher. It's called confluence of information. It's the merging of information from many sectors that paints a picture. SM Energy on a short-term perspective looks, looks pretty dang good. Uh, even Forces Metals on a short-term perspective, you can see that they are trending higher, uh, which is obviously positive. Looking at these from a little bit different perspective, you can kind of see the first hump here, and this is the second hump. And we got that like, kind of V-bottom, and hopefully this continues higher. Uh, Forces Metals, again, we got that same pattern. If you look, I'm just going to try to get them both in here. This pattern is actually this pattern here over the si same time frame. Mar uh, March, April, this is the April time frame, and they both kind of took off. And you can say that these energy sectors kind of moving very similarly. Looking at the uranium price, I put this at the bottom. It's also breaking a descending wedge pattern, which usually means it's going to break and move to the upside, which we are seeing and realizing right now. We also have the S&P, I think, GSCI index, which is a commodity index, which also broke its descending wedge pattern to the upside. Uh, and I suspect it would go, it's going to go up. And move a lot higher over time. And again, guys, I don't know the path it's going to take. I can't tell you it's going to go straight up. I can't tell you if it's going to pull back and then go up or if it's going to match this movement where it goes sideways a little bit and then goes higher. It doesn't really matter to me. It broke the downtrend. It's probably going to go sideways to higher uh, over time, similar to what uranium has done, but uh, it, it's very good. So these are some of the things that I look at when I'm looking at investments. Now, I didn't put up the market deficits here. I didn't put up 
some of the inventory numbers, and some of that stuff is not known very well, uh, especially worldwide. So it's it's difficult to get some of the information, but if you have the information, that's that's all the better. Uh, but when valuations, when that gold to oil ratio or the gold to uranium ratio, when that gets really cheap and we go below the cost curves, I didn't put cost curves up here either. But when you go below the high cost producers, uh, for uranium, that's like 60 bucks, 50 bucks, somewhere in that range. You start getting below that, you know that supply is going to get cut way back. And if supply is getting cut back and you're starting to see the demand and supply go into balance, and then eventually you're going to go into deficit, which means that prices are going to have to increase to incentivize more production. Uh, these are the things that I exactly look at. And my approach isn't, I don't sit here and try to make 100% gains or, or 200 or whatever. I go for the big stuff. That's how I'm setting this up. And it takes a long time. It doesn't take, you know, two weeks or, or two months or something like that. It takes years, five to 10 years even. So that's what I'm looking for when I'm looking at investments. I'm not looking for a short term, quick, you know, quick turn of 20% or 40% or 100%. Uh, I'm looking for something I can pile money into uh, and and really use as an investment to, to really get a huge return out of it. And the way that I do that is by looking at these trades, by looking at uh, the market conditions, and it is a part of timing it uh, because commodities, commodities look the worst at the bottom and they look the best at the top. So if you try doing cash flow models and net present value and all this stuff, it, it's not going to be pretty for you because you're going to be buying at the exact wrong time. You're going to be buying at a top and not at a, at a bottom. You have to buy them when everybody hates them and they look really bad. And then the price turns around and then they become rocket ships. Now, is this going to be an easy ride with commodities coming up? I'm not exactly sure. It seems like um, the markets almost become more volatile sometimes as these swings are so big. But uh, my strategy is to buy them when they're cheap. I know they're cheap. You buy them, you hold on. If we have another market dip or whatever, I just hold on and I buy more. I mean, that's been my strategy. Uh, I control risk by by portfolio allocation size, uh, I size things larger, smaller, given the risk of the company, or at least the perceived risk that I put on it. I underweight exploration companies because they're they're ultra risky. Sometimes they don't find anything; they just eat up all your money and don't go anywhere. Sometimes they don't track the underlying commodity very well, depending on the, the sector that you're in. So, what I prefer to do. Is I like royalty companies because, depending on the royalty, but I like most royalty companies because they're diversified by nature. They have a whole bunch of different royalties with a whole bunch of different mining companies. The majority of them do, and there's no they don't subject themselves to a uh, input cost. Their input costs are pretty stable. They have a very small number of employees, and the revenue per employee is, is quite dramatic. So if it's a diversified income stream and they have, let's say, metals of some sort, a metal that I like or, or a sector or a group, and all they need is, is the price to go up and the volume to be produced of whatever, whatever the mineral is, they're going to make more money. Some of the mining companies are subject to input costs and inflation, uh, and sometimes they struggle. Uh, under a high inflationary environment because of these guys behind me, this this energy. So what I try to do is I try to find investments in that meet all of those criterias. The criterias that, that I like a lot and some the ones that meet it uh, are uranium, oil, natural gas. Uh, those are my probably my favorite. And then I have some of the metals like platinum, silver and in gold looks good too uh and then in the base metals i like copper a lot nickel's pretty good i think those two stand out tin's pretty good as well uh but those those are the ones that i that i really like that i really like yeah i like those 
And sometimes if you know something is such a big opportunity and you don't have to put all of the risk on, you can. And if you do go full risk, make sure it's at the lowest risk opportune time to do it. But, and and that means timing it, which means that the ratio is super low if you want to know. Uh, But sometimes the physical metals are going to be your best bets in some of it because there's really no risk with it. So if you know that you can get a very good upside return and there's really little risk, sometimes that's the button that I like to hit because the risk is so low. And and that's what draws me to it. Uh, If something happens to your investment and it goes up eightfold, tenfold, twentyfold, the actual commodity itself, And you're in a company that doesn't do anything. (laughs) I mean, you just missed your opportunity. So uh, I just want to make sure that you guys are getting the leverage that you want. Uh, Make sure you're getting it. Uh, I say don't take on all the risk in the world. Uh, Do what, what fits your personality type. And risk doesn't mean volatility. Risk means that uh, something goes up and it, and, and it, whatever you're in doesn't go up or it goes negative, or it gets nationalized, or something happens. Uh, so that's 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 the risk. So I wouldn't put all my money in the high-risk stuff. Uh, I put roughly 20% of my net worth in the riskier stuff, and then I put a whole bunch in the non-risk stuff. That's the way that I do it. If you guys like this content, you know, give me a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, uh, and thanks for listening. This is Finding Value.